Yes? Okay. Can you, can you hear? Yeah. Fine. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> and uh, he's also co-director of the Cavity QED team, the CQED team. And he has won several awards, among them the uh, Unfair Prize of the French Academy of Sciences in 1998. And in 2017, he got the uh, Prix des Trois Physiciens. Physicien. Mm -hmm. And I never heard of this uh, Prix de, the Prize of the Three Physicists. <laughs> so I want to look it up. And uh, it's actually it's a prize. Maybe we're going to talk about this, but it's a prize that was named after three directors, consecutive directors of laboratories in the Economie Superior, who were uh, murdered in the Second World War. So it's really uh, a prestigious prize. So today, uh, Professor Boone is going to talk about controlling quantum states with circular right variables. <clears throat> okay. So the talk. Thank you uh, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation uh, for giving. Uh, this colloquium at this very, uh, very nice, very prestigious institute thing. So the topic of my talk about uh, will be about the uh, development of new experimental method for performing well uh, controlled manipulation of uh, quantum systems. And, it, uh, and indeed, this topic sits in the, in the context of the very fast development, uh, the present development of quantum technologies, which relies on the development of very many different platforms with a very high degree of control of the quantum states of single particles and then of many uh, and many uh, more particles. So let me just mention a few examples of such uh, platforms. Uh, I would like to start with the trapped ion platforms, which maybe was one of the earliest to get the, a very high degree of control uh, we know today, where single ions have the internal state manipulated by lasers in order to create entanglement in the ion chain and to perform a quantum information operation. Then uh, the atomic system, neutral atoms are also of very great uh, interest uh, in this uh, topic of controlled manipulation of quantum system and of quantum simulation, and nowadays uh, cold atom physicists are able to uh, fabricate artificial lattices, which is kind of artificial matter with exactly one atom per site, and they can perform very nice quantum simulation uh, with that. Another uh, nice controlled platform is, consists in uh, putting atom in cavities, so that the field of cavity QD, so I will tell you more about this field later, but I would like to mention that I am interested in microwave and Rydberg atom cavity QD, but there are many very important and interesting things in optical cavity QD, where the field is an optical field stored between very high Q optical mirrors, and where people can manipulate the quantum state of the field, which leads out of the cavity at a very high degree of control. Then polar molecules are well, are very promising when uh, trapped uh, in optical lattices. And then the last category on this side corresponds to solid state devices. So not only single atoms, single ions, or single photon can be manipulated with a very high degree of control. But for example, in the field of spintronics, the spin of single electron can be controlled in some nano 
circuits involving nanoelectrodes, allowing to manipulate uh, the spin of single electrons. Another very promising platform for uh, 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 developing quantum information manipulation is, of course, the circuit QED uh, domain in which uh, atoms are indeed artificial atoms made of small superconducting circuits whose quantum stain can be uh, controlled very much, uh, especially by using cavity QED techniques, by coupling these superconducting qubits with superconducting uh, microwave waveguide and resonators. And uh, this field is a very uh, important <coughs> field and very fast developing field uh, in the community of uh, quantum information and quantum uh, technology. And uh, of course, I can, it's maybe not a, a surprise for you, the last system which will be uh, of interest for me and I will focus on uh, in the next part of the lecture is the Rydberg atom system on which uh, we acquired uh, some experience in the last year. So before going into what we uh, presently do with the Rydberg atom, let me mention uh, the context of uh, many other experiments with Rydberg atoms. So the physics of uh, Rydberg atoms uh, became a, a very active field uh, in the last uh, 10 years, I, I would say, and in various different contexts. For example, in quantum optics, many experiments uh, now uh, manage to manipulate the quantum state of light by using a dipole interaction uh, between the Rydberg atom and the so-called dipole blockade phenomena, which manifests uh, as strong nonlinearities for manipulating uh, the, the, the field statistics by using uh, EIT, uh, electromagnetic induced transparency uh, techniques. Then another very uh, active field is the field of quantum simulation. And here I mentioned two of the experiments uh, belonging to this field. So in uh, uh, both of these experiments, the basic is the high degree of control of ultra-cold atoms. Not yet Rydberg atoms, but ground state atoms. And in both of these experiments, the Rydberg interaction is controlled by starting by, with ground state atoms with very well-defined position in optical traps. So in the experiment of Munich by the group of Immanuel Bloch, the atom can be prepared in lattices with exactly one atom per site using a MOT insulator techniques, and then starting from this very well controlled uh, initial sample of atom, they can switch on interaction by doing what we call a Rydberg dressing of the Rydberg atoms, of the ground state atoms, which basically consists in having some non resonant laser coupling slightly the ground state level to the Rydberg level, adding a, a, a little bit of mixing of the Rydberg wave function into uh, the ground state atom making it, them interact more strongly as compared to the interaction between two ground state atoms, which is very, very weak. So the other way to use the, 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 the Rydberg atom is the one used in the team of Antoine Boers or Michel Lukin in uh, Paris-Saclay or in, uh, in Harvard, where basically they use optical tweezers to trap deterministically and to create deterministically a very well-controlled lattice of ground state atoms where they construct it in a different way as compared to Immanuel Bloch experiment, where the distance here is constrained by the half the wavelength, the size of the lattice. Here, the tweezers can be adjusted at will and are very flexible for preparing different lattices with different shapes, with different uh, lattices spacing. And in this experiment, instead of using a dressing in order to control interaction, to give interaction to the ground state atom, they use just the resonant interaction by transiently promoting selectively one atom in the Rydberg state or many atoms in the Rydberg state so that they directly uh, interact when in, in the Rydberg levels. So that's uh, three examples uh, of use uh, of uh, Rydberg atom interactions in the context of quantum information manipulation. And uh, now I will focus on uh, 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 another uh, type of system, which is the one we developed uh, in our group uh, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure together with Serge Arroche and Jean-Michel Raymond, which is the cavity QED setup made of a high-Q superconducting cavity, which is used as a trap for photons, 
which interacts with some very well-controlled atoms, which are so-called circular Rydberg atoms. So I don't want to tell you everything about the story of the interaction. Yes? Can you tell us what Rydberg atoms are and Rydberg electrons? Okay, so it, it will be the next slide, but I can anticipate. So the Rydberg atoms uh, are uh, very highly excited uh, uh, bounded level of atoms. So if you look at the hydrogen atom, you have somewhere the ionization limit. You are the uh, deep level and the uh, ground state atom, let's say 1s for hydrogen. And then you, you have a, a series of levels which becomes closer and closer as you get close to the ionization limit. So these levels are defined by a, a principal quantum number n and the binding energy is like one over n square. That's the rule for the energy spacing between the, the level. So usually what we call Rydberg atoms here, that these heterogeneic level, which are close to the ionization limit. And in our case, the principal quantum number would be like 50. And I will explain why it's nice tools for our experiment in one slide from now. So let me just mention the, the kind of thing we managed to perform uh, 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 with this system together uh, with Serge Laroche and, and Jean-Michel Raymond. So we built an experiment in which uh, a superconducting cavity made of superconducting mirror uh, behave as a very, very good trap for trapping photons. And so the superconductor can be so good that the lifetime of a photon can be larger than one-tenth of a second, so time scales, and you can even feel at the uh, human uh, scale. Then uh, we developed uh, uh, tools for manipulating uh, this field, which is trapped in a cavity, by using matter. And in this sense, we do kind of the opposite of what people do uh, with ions. With trapped ions, people trap matter and observe the matter with light. Here, we trap light and observe it with atom, with the red bag atom. And the coupling is strong, so I will tell you more about this uh, in, in two slides. And using this system, we were able to uh, realize experimentally uh, an experiment in which it was possible to count photons in a cavity without uh, destroying them and observe quantum jumps of the field. It was also prepared to, uh, uh, possible to prepare non-classical superposition of the field, which are interesting in the context of understanding, uh, understanding the quantum theory of measurement and the role of decoherence in the quantum theory of measurement. So we prepared a so-called Schrodinger cat state of the field in the cavity, which is a coherent superposition state, a quantum superposition state of two nearly classical fields with opposite phases. So the quantum properties of this are very not intuitive because if you want to figure out kind of classically how does this field look like, it's a field with at the same time two opposite phases. But it's not the interference of two fields with opposite phases, which would be just vacuum. So it's a kind of strange object. So by developing uh, this experiment, we acquired on kind of a long term some expertise with the manipulation of Friedberg atom. And now uh, in my talk, I will focus on a more recent experiment relying basically of uh, uh, an increased degree of control of the Rydberg atom as compared uh, to this uh, cavity QD experiment uh, I just uh, mentioned before. So the first improvement we recently achieved is a better control of atomic motion. So in, in the uh, original experiment, the atoms were fast atoms, so the interaction time was short in the range of tenths of microsecond. And you can imagine that if you are able to trap photons for one tenth of a second, it's a pity to interact with them only for 20 microseconds. And then we implemented in the experiment a cold atom source, so which is vertical beam of cold atom with a velocity of about eight meters per second, uh, which allow one to increase the interaction time between photon and cavity by more than one order of magnitude. And I will present you an experiment uh, performed with this new setup with controlled uh, velocity of the atom. So another uh, direction uh, we explored is the control of the Rydberg state, the quantum state of the Rydberg atom itself. And here you can forget about cavity. So wh wh what is there? Uh, wh what is interesting there? Well, if you have uh, one Rydberg level here, with a given uh, a value of the principal quantum number, indeed, if you zoom in, this level is strongly degenerate. 
you have like n square levels for principal quantum level n, which is a large number of levels. And then if you apply to the atom some electric field, you have a very regular structure. This is the Stark diagram, the position of energy level of rubidium atoms with principal quantum number n equal 52. So this energy structure can be manipulated in a very nice way by, uh, for, for navigating in this structure and preparing either circular Rydberg atoms, which are the one with maximum value of the magnetic quantum number. So the horizontal axis here is a magnetic quantum number, vertical axis is the energy. You have two circular atoms with plus m and minus m, and m equals n minus one. And the elliptical level, which uh, are represented here just like uh, it was uh, planetary atoms. So these levels have low angular momentum and correspond in the classical limit to orbit with a large uh, ellipticity. And what we uh, uh, showed is that by applying uh, to this system some radio frequency at resonance with all this smooth transition, will well control polarization we can really engineer the quantum state of the red bag atom, prepare Schrodinger cat states superposition of two very different orbits, which are very efficient sensor for electric or magnetic field. So I will uh, tell you more about that uh, in the main part of the talk. Sorry, what, what, yes. What atom do you use? Rubidium. Why? Why? Okay. Uh, hydrogen is nice, very irregular, down to ground state. But it's not very nice for laser excitation because it's UV lasers and it's not very nice to have atomic beam, it's very fast. So rubidium basically is nice because at the time we started the experiment, more or less alkali atom, the, the, the basic property of alkali atom are very similar with respect to Rydberg levels. And then at that time, it was the beginning of laser diodes, semiconductor lasers, and it was easy and chic to bag here, yeah, free laser diode to excite the rubidium. So that was the reason of the historical choice of rubidium, which is a good alkali atom for many other reasons in atomic physics. For cooling, it's also a very good atom. So and it's not ionized. It's not ionized. It, it's prepared with an electron close to ionization. It will be ionized to detect it. So we'll, we'll, we'll see in a while. You, you can apply some small electric field, like 100 volt per centimeter. You get one electron, one ion that you can accelerate and count one by one. So the red bag atoms are nice because you can count them one by one. But if they're neutral, how they're trapped? They're trapped by magnetic. What? They're trapped uh, in, the, uh, in the dipole of the magnetic. Okay, so I, I will uh, come to this topic of trapping the red bag atoms uh, in, in the last part. Of course, it would be interesting not to trap just the ground state atom, as I mentioned, but the red bag atom. <laughs> And that's one, one part of the project uh, I will discuss. OK? So the next thing one could improve is the control of interaction. So up to now, we were not using interaction between Rydberg atoms. We were even avoiding them. Because if you have two atoms at the same time uh, inside the cavity, they talk to each other by the intermediate of the cavity field, and everything becomes much more complicated. So the experiment up to now were at the level of single atoms. So having two or more atoms is interesting, especially in the context of quantum simulation. As you already mentioned, you need a strong interaction between the particles to perform uh, quantum simulation, and you need controllable interaction. And I will show you that indeed, red bag atoms provide very controllable interaction if they are trapped. So that's why the next step of the degree of control is, improve, is implementing trapping of circular red bag atoms. And if you applied properly some electric and eventually magnetic field to the atom, you can really tune the Rydberg atom interaction and explore some phase diagram of solid state system of interest for quantum simulation. So we'll improve uh, the degree of control interaction by implementing trapping of circular atom, and we already uh, started this. And uh, the last uh, point uh, we try to have a better control on is spontaneous emission. So when you think about spontaneous emission, you may believe that spontaneous emission is like the frequency of transition of the atom is given by nature and you cannot avoid it. It's a reversible process and usually it's difficult to fight against a reversible irreversibility. Indeed you can, if you can modify the structure of the mode of the electromagnetic field around the atom. 
because spontaneous emission is coupling to a continuum of empty uh, field mode around the atom. But if you suppress the mode, basically you can suppress spontaneous emission. So that's what we plan to do with a structure with two plates in between which one we, we plan to trap the circular red bag atom. And you, uh, to this structure, we expect that the single atom lifetime may be promoted from tens of milliseconds to thousands of seconds. So maybe we can, in the future, get the circular red bag atom trapped for 10 minutes and then use it uh, for quantum simulation with very long time scale of the quantum simulation. So then, once we control all the things, the plan is to put everything together to build a quantum simulator of what we call XXZ spin chain, and I will uh, take, give precision about what it is uh, in, the, in the last part of the talk. So let me uh, briefly uh, present the outline of the talk. I'll start with a description of what we got with the cavity QD experiment with a slow beam. And then I will go to topics where we do not anymore use a cavity, but you use the red bag atom either in itself for preparing non-classical states of the orbit of the red bag electron. And then I will uh, present you the project we have for controlling the interaction between the red bag atoms in a quantum simulator. So let's start with the cavity QD experiment. And then I, I apologize for those of you who attend uh, the lecture of the school. We already heard about this first part of the talk. So I'll try to be not too long on this part so that you have uh, uh, the new uh, topic uh, presented. So what is the uh, basic ingredient of the cavity QD experiment? It's two level atoms. And two level atoms, I will uh, consider as a generic spin. Uh, spin one half has two levels, and any two level atom can be mapped into uh, a spin system. Then uh, the other element, the second element of cavity QD experiment is an oscillator. So let's say a spring. And in your case, the spring, the oscillator, is one mode, one quantized mode of the electromagnetic field in the cavity. And I will consider uh, in the following only a single mode of the cavity, which is supposed to be close to resonance, or even in this talk, at resonance with the atom, so that the effect of the other modes of the cavity are completely neglected. So one quantum mode of the field is represented by a harmonic oscillator whose energy states correspond to number, photon number states. So here the ground state is the vacuum of the cavity field, and then states containing one, two, three, and more photons uh, in a harmonic scale. Then the essential ingredient for new is a coupling between the two systems. So the, physically, the coupling is electric dipole coupling. And it's strong because red bag atoms are big atoms with large dipole. And because the field in the cavity is confined in a small volume, so even if you have only one photon, the field per photon uh, reach a non-negligible uh, value. So let me uh, tell you just a little bit more about the two elements of the experiment, the cavity, which is a superconducting cavity used for trapping photons, and the atom, which is uh, the so-called circular red bag atom. So you, you, you have to realize that the kind of cavity uh, the technology allows us uh, to fabricate are already very good cavities. So the damping time I mentioned of 0.1 second corresponds to quality factors of 4, 10 to the 10, which correspond to a finesse number of travel back and forth between the two mirrors of the order of several billions. So that's better than any other kind of cavity in other uh, frequency range. And that makes microwave photons very good candidates uh, for uh, being a very isolated field from the environment for performing a quantum uh, mechanic experiment, provided you get uh, atoms which are some coupling with this trapped microwave photon. And it is a very good thing for us. And when you go to the red bag atom, first you get transition frequency if you choose the principal quantum number properly and the transition between n equal 50 and n equal 51. The frequency of the transition, 51 gigahertz, match the kind of frequency you can uh, manage with a very high Q superconducting cavity I just mentioned. In addition, the red bag atom is a kind of giant atom. The size of the circular orbit is like n squared times the size of the ground state of the hydrogen atom. 
And the electric dipole moment corresponding to this large orbit corresponds to thousands, more than 1,000 atomic units. So this atom, which is a giant atom, is like a large antenna strongly coupled to the microwave field. And it will be a very good sensor of the field stored in the cavity, even if there is only a single photon. And that's what I will show you in the experiment I will present now. So the setup with the slow atom uh, is here. The cavity has its axis horizontal, and uh, the atoms are just flying vertically uh, through the cavity. The atoms are prepared so by laser cooling technique, and then they uh, are promoted in the Rydberg state at the center of the cavity, which is kind of challenging. Preparing the circular Rydberg atoms at the center of cavity uh, is difficult because in the old days, we needed some magnetic field to prepare the circular atom. You cannot apply magnetic field inside the superconductor, so you have to find another way. And the other way consists in controlling the polarization of radio frequency around the atom. I will tell more about this later. So with this experiment, so cavity dumping time, we have to fabricate a new cavity. It was not as good as the best one, but good enough for what I present today. And indeed, in this regime where atoms at velocity of about 10 meters per second, I will describe an experiment where we had a very good control of the resonant interaction of the atom, and we used it in order to generate the larger Schrodinger cat state we ever prepared uh, with this experiment. So how does this work? Indeed, the basis is the coupling between atom and cavity at the single photon level. So if you look at the quantum mechanical system, <coughs> you have a, a, a coupling between two quantum states, which are degenerated at, at resonance, which correspond to one atom excited and vacuum in the cavity, and one atom in ground state, the lower state of the transition resonant to the cavity, and one photon in the cavity. And all other states of the quantum system are non-degenerate, they have more energy, or the ground state is not of interest, it's an atom in the lower state with zero photon and nothing happened uh, in this state. So if you uh, prepare the atom in this multiplicity, what you expect is that the electric dipole coupling between these two states produces a Rabi oscillation. That's a very basic quantum mechanical result. If you have two degenerate levels and some coupling, you expect Rabi oscillation. If you prepare, for example, an excited atom, the energy is expected to oscillate between the cavity and the atom. And here the Rabi oscillation formula for the state of, for the atom field state is written. So this phenomenon is a coherence phenomenon. It involves a coherence superposition of two quantum states. So let us do this experiment. So in the experiment, we prepare the cavity in vacuum. We prepare a single circular Rydberg atom at the center of the cavity by some laser pulse and some micro microwave and radio frequency pulses. I will give details later. And then you see what we observe. Effectively, we observe the so-called vacuum Rabi oscillation corresponding to emission and reabsorption of a photon periodically as a function of time. And you see that this system is very well controlled. There is no observable dumping. In contrast to what we observed more than 20 years ago when we uh, had the first realization of this vacuum Rabi oscillation experiment. So this was performed with fast atoms, with many imperfections, which are not anymore there uh, with the new experiments, so with a much better degree of control. Indeed, you can feel a bit uncomfortable because the, 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 the signal uh, looks like no, noisy. It's not just a pure uh, sinusoid. And you are right, it is not a pure sinusoid because the cavity is not at absolute zero temperature, and there is a residual probability of having one photon in the experiment. And indeed, what you see here is a bit node between vacuum in 90% of the case and one photon field in 10% of the case, which gives uh, the red curve, if you do the theory, which fits perfectly uh, with the experimental data. So it's interesting to go into the more complex situation where you put some field inside the cavity before starting the Rabi oscillation. And indeed, the story is very similar. If you start an excited atom interacting with a cavity containing n photons, at resonance, this state, this level, is degenerate with a single state, the atom in the lower state, and one more photon in the cavity. And again, you expect Rabi oscillation with this two state, but at a frequency which is faster. Why is it faster? 
because the dipole is the same, but the electric field is larger. You have some energy in the cavity, and the electric field, the energy is the square of the electric field. So the electric field is the square root of the photon number, plus one, because even if vacuum, in vacuum, the excited atom emits. And then what occurs is the Rabi oscillation at this frequency, omega naught square root of n plus one. Then, if the cavity is not in a pure state, but in a superposition state of various value of the photon number, the Rabi oscillation signal is expected to be the sum of the individual Rabi oscillation signal in a film containing exactly n photons. So that's uh, a simple result, and uh, this leads indeed to very interesting physics. So here is again the Rabi oscillation signal, observed not with the cavity in the vacuum, but with the cavity containing initially a coherent field with on average 13 photons. So it's not uh, completely uh, microscopic, it's not a single photon field, it's already a kind of mesoscopic object with 13 photons in the cavity, which is good enough to define the phase and the classical amplitude uh, of this state. So what you observe is a collapse of the Rabi oscillation at a very fast time scale and a revival. So why does this occur? Indeed, as I told you, the Rabi oscillation is now a superposition of many different frequencies. But the important point is that the, the, the frequencies involved in the evolution are discrete frequencies in finite number. So after some time, <coughs> the, uh, all the uh, frequencies in these spectrums became again in phase, and you accept a revival of the Rabi oscillation. So you can calculate the revival time because you know all these frequencies, and the time needed so that all components becomes again in phase is of the order of the vacuum Rabi period, T naught, multiplied by the square root of the average photon number. Which means that for large photon number, in the classical limit, the revival becomes later and later, and indeed this quantum feature uh, disappears uh, in the classical limit. The other feature, the collapse of this, is the same phenomena. It's not that all components become in phase, but they just become very fast out of phase because they have different frequency. And this leads uh, to the collapse of the Rabi oscillation. So indeed, this revival of the Rabi oscillation is indeed the signature of the discreteness of the photon number in the cavity. And what is very interesting is that if you just perform the Fourier transform of this, what is not obvious with your eyes is visible if you do the Fourier transform. You have only discrete frequencies, and the position of the peaks are exactly where you expect them. So vertical blue lines correspond to frequency expected for a well-defined photon number. So this is a very nice and very nice manifestation of field quantization in the cavity. So the next interesting step is to look at what happened here at a time where everything is out of phase and you have no Rabi oscillation at half revival time. So at half revival time, a very interesting thing appears. When the interaction starts, the atoms become entangled with the cavity field. But this entanglement disappears at that time, so I will not give the mathematical details, so that at that time, the, field, the atom field state is a product state between some atomic state and some field state, which have the interest to be a Schrodinger cat state. So automatically, at half revival, you prepare a quantum superposition of two quasi-classical states with basically opposite amplitudes. And uh, here is the Wigner function of this Schrodinger cat state, where you see as the two blue spots, the two classical components of the superposition, and the oscillations here are kind of interference fringes, which are the signature of the coherent superposition. So this is prepared, and we can characterize it in the experiment using the following property. What is the photon number distribution in this cat state? Well, this is a coherent state. It has a Poisson distribution. This is another coherent state with a Poisson distribution. But when the two uh, phases of the classical fields are in phase opposition, the new photon number distribution is a quantum interference between the probability amplitudes of these two components. And if you look at the detail, if you have a minus sign here, only the odd photon number survive in the superposition. So this Schrodinger cat state is an odd cat state involving only odd photon numbers. And then you can characterize the parity of the cat by looking again at the Rabi oscillation. 
So indeed, we do the RBO oscillation not anymore in a coherent field, but in a cat superposition state presented here. And in this state, what we observe is a revival, the usual revival, but also another one at half revival time. And why is it there? It's related to the parity of the cat. If you look at the two, at all the frequency component of the signal, you see that here everybody is again in phase, but at half this time, all even and all old photon number are in phase because the uh, frequency spacing is twice, basically. So it means that the fact that you see oscillations here means that the parity of the field is well defined. And if you look into the details, here we have a field with only an even photon number that you can check by performing the Fourier transform of this signal. The Fourier transform is presented here. Only the even photon number survives there, which proves that you have a current superposition of these two states. It's a cat state and not a statistical mixture. So uh, here is a more realistic representation uh, of the cat prepared in the experiment. There are some distortion due to some nonlinearities of the system, but an important parameter is the size of the cat. How, how big is this cat? How, how, how much is this close to the classical world? And a good way to characterize the size of the cat is to look in the complex plane, where you have the complex plane, uh, the complex amplitude of the field displayed at the distance between these two things. And uh, this distance is like the amplitude of the field, so a distance square is homogeneous to kind of a photon number. So in our case, the distance is like 46 photons. So 46 photons, it's not a lot at all scale, but it's a lot for a controlled superposition state of a quantum system. So this state is of interest for investigating decoherence and uh, make, making some kind of metrology of decoherence, but at the present point, the experiment uh, is there. So let me go uh, to the second topic, which is the control manipulation of the internal state of the Rydberg atom. So how does it work to manipulate uh, this quantum state and to manipulate the shape of the orbit of the Rydberg atom? Indeed, to understand what happened, one has to zoom in uh, what uh, is the structure of one Rydberg multiplicity with a given principal quantum number. So typically, principal quantum number uh, 51, or 51 or even 52 in the case of the figure presented here. And uh, to control the multiplicity, you have to get rid of the degeneracy of all the level, because all level degenerate will interact with anything, and it's not a well-controlled situation. And the way to control the interaction, and to control the, the state of the atom, consists in applying some electric field. So we use the Stark effect of hydrogen-like atoms. And how is this Stark effect? Well, when you plug electric field here, perpendicular to the orbit of circular atom, you set a quantization axis for which the magnetic quantum number remains a good quantum number due to the cylindrical symmetry. So M is still a good quantum number. L is not anymore a good quantum number. And you have new states, which are called parabolic states, but you don't care. You don't need to care about them. What you have to care about is that uh, all the level arrives in such a kind of triangular structure with equal spacing between all transitions delta m equal plus or minus one. And this transition is a so-called Stark frequency. It's typically 100 megahertz for one volt per centimeter to the atom. So this is a very regular Stark diagram with all transitions from circular to low angular moments to state which are degenerate. And then, if you apply a well uh, 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 radio frequency field resonant on all these transitions with a well-defined polarization, you have a very nice controlled quantum system. First, you can ignore many of the levels, which make the thing very complex. So you can ignore all the other levels of the multiplicity except this one. This is a closed sub-ensemble of level coupled by sigma plus radio frequency. And then the, the beauty and the simplicity of the system is that the structure of this space, which have like n minus one state, is like a big angular momentum G. And then if you apply radio frequency to big angular momentum, you just manipulate a big spin like you do in magnetic resonance. So you will apply rotation of the spin and you can move along this diagonal by performing rotation of this big spin. And that's the heart of the manipulation of the quantum state of the uh, atom uh, in this experiment. 
So here is the, the sketch of the experimental setup. This experiment is a fast atom experiment, an atomic beam experiment. It may become a slow atom one in the future. So there are lasers to excite the atom at the center of a structure, which is not anymore a cavity. Indeed, this looks like a cavity, but the mirrors are flat. And they are just used as electrode to apply some electric field to the atom, a vertical electric field, which sets the quantization axis. Then uh, we uh, perform, uh, we, we, we use the dynamic uh, of the big angular momentum uh, in this uh, subspace that we control by applying resonant radio frequency field. And indeed, the evolution uh, of the big angular momentum looks like this. It's really a rotation of a large vector around an axis here, x, which is set by the radio frequency field driving the transition. So when you stop the rotation after some evolution, you prepare what is called a coherent spin state. It's not a pure state of the, uh, it's not an eigenvector of the Hamiltonian, they are represented here. It's a quantum superposition of neighboring state which resembles very much the coherent state in quantum optics. So it's quantum superposition which la looks like a nearly big classical spin pointing in that direction. And indeed, by manipulating the motion of this big spin, we can make the motion quantum in a very uh, nice way. First, uh, here is the Rabi, uh, the, okay. So we perform the first experiment in which we prepare uh, initially the atom in the upper state of this uh, generalized block sphere, which corresponds indeed uh, to the circular state. The top of the block sphere is circular state, the bottom of the sphere is uh, the very elliptical state with low m. So we prepare this state and we look at the evolution of the population in the circular state as a function of time. And what you observe is this. So as a function of time, the peaks corresponds to the time where uh, you reach the circular state uh, in the evolution. And you see that you reach it periodically. And uh, you have a very current evolution. You see like more than 20 uh, oscillations uh, of the system. So that's a very well controlled system and uh, the, the system really behave large, large, like a large angular momentum which is uh, modulated, manipulated with a radio frequency field. So we can do better by adding some, uh, some knob for controlling uh, this motion and making, the, making, the, making it a quantum. And the idea is to use uh, so-called the quantum Zeno effects, a generalized version of the quantum Zeno effects, which leads to quantum Zeno dynamics. So usually the quantum Zeno effects consist in preparing uh, a quantum state in a state and measuring it uh, in, in, with an observable uh, for which the initial state is an either vector. And then you reproject uh, uh, very efficiently the system on its initial state and you freeze its evolution. Here, instead of projecting on the initial state, we will project in, in a larger state by having a measurement which divides the Hilbert space in subspaces, which means that inside a subspace, the measurement is ambiguous and eventually some evolution can occur. So the quantum Zeno dynamics consists in applying some measurements which set borders in the Hilbert space. And then the very classical dynamic, in your case, it's the rotation of the spin, can become quantum. In the same way as depicted on this picture, if you have a cat just walking between two walk, classically the cat would just stop when you reach the walk, wall or eventually try to jump over the wall. But in the quantum world, where you have a measurement of position which plays a role of a wall, the cat will disappear here and reappear on the other side. And that's what occurs with the big spin when we put some wall around the classical dynamics. And the way to put a hole consists in performing a measurement or virtual measurement of one of the quantum states of the later corresponding to the large angular momentum. And indeed, if you look at the stark spectrum, if you apply some microwave resonance on the transition between the two force levels, the fifth levels uh, of the multiplicity, this microwave is resonant there, but due to the linear stack effect, is non-resonant on the other state. 
So it allows you, in principle, by looking whether the atom goes from here to here, to measure whether k, k equal 4 is reached. So indeed, we, we do the experiment. We start again the rotation of the spin, but we put a wall which should stop the evolution when the vector reaches this level. And what, what, what occurs? What occurs is represented in this movie. When the field state reaches the wall, like the cat, it does not just stop, but, uh, I'm sorry. But it reappears. Ah, this really wants to jump. Ah, uh, OK. So you see that the, 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 the spin just stops the motion, but reappears on the other side. And it, it, at the intermediate state, you see fringes between the two components of the fin. That's the signature again of the Schrodinger cat state. So let's look a little bit more into the details. Here are some view of the quantum state seen from the top of the uh, effective block sphere. You see that as a function of time, the initial states, which looks like the circle, the circle represents the quantum fluctuations of the spin. It evolves to the top, but when it reaches the border, it is transformed into a superposition of two spins pointing in two different directions. Here you don't, don't see uh, the fringes because the representation is not the Wigner function, but the Q function, which does not show that uh, the, the fringes. Indeed, in the experiment, we perform some tomography of the state, reconstruct the Wigner function, and that's the experimentally reconstructed state of the spin, which effectively points in two directions in a current way, in a current superposition of these two directions. So then we use this tool, the manipulation of the large angular momentum by rotation, to prepare other kind of Schrodinger cat state. So I will not give the details. But we, for example, prepare the superposition state of the circular state here and the uh, very elliptical uh, state there. And this superposition state is, is a superposition of two very different orbits with two very different polarizabilities. The circular state has no dipole, so I've raised the value of the dipole along the quantization axis is zero, whereas the elliptical state has the maximal possible dipole in the multiplicity. So it is very sensitive to electric field. And from this superposition, we uh, fabricated the best uh, ever uh, sensor for electric field with a sensitivity here in the range of hundred, uh, hundreds of microvolts per centimeter with a very short uh, interaction time between the atom uh, and the electric field. And you can define in this system some standard quantum limit by uh, evaluating the performance of the classical states and, and the Heisenberg limit that you reach nearly with this uh, Schrodinger cat state. So on the other hand, we also fabricated a very good uh, magnetometer uh, out of this, where uh, the atom can be prepared again by manipulating not only sigma plus transition, but both sigma plus and sigma minus transition, one can prepare a superposition of two circular states with opposite value of m. Then the difference of uh, magnetic momentum between these two states is like 100 mu b. So it's 100 more sensitive than the spin one half to magnetic field. And so it's a good magnetic sensor. So this superposition was used to perform magnetometry again uh, with a very high uh, sensitivity. So the last application of all states uh, rely on an application of the recently developed quantum control techniques in order to uh, generate controlled uh, quantum states by using a, a, a controlled pulse of radio frequency uh, in our case. So what can be controlled there? Indeed, I, I was just fuzzy about the details of the experiment up to now. I saw I, I told you that the uh, atomic uh, sublevels considered here were just like hydro hydrogen with a large angular momentum g. Indeed, this is wrong if you look at the first level. The lowest value of m are, are not the levels of hydrogen, but the levels of rubidium with what we call a quantum defect. So the position of the m levels is not right with respect to hydrogen. It means that when you perform the rotations, there are imperfections around there. 
that you see when you perform an experiment where you measure all the populations of the various levels as a function of time. And if you start with an atom here, again, I can try to start the movie. So here, correspond to the state here. You go to the circular state, which is just on the other side uh, on the block sphere, in a way which is not perfect. And you see that some population remains on this yellow line in the state a m equal 1. In addition, when you reach the circular state, you still have some population in the neighbors. And this is related to this anomaly with respect to hydrogen. But this anomaly is very well known. So you can correct for it by playing with the parameters of, of the radio frequency pulse. And uh, so we developed together with uh, Christian Koch and Sabrina Patch uh, from Kassel uh, a strategy for uh, calculating optimal pulse for uh, transferring all the population from here to here in spite of the fact that you are not in hydrogen. So that's the ideal pulse. It's not uh, intuitive. But you see that now the evolution of the system with the optimized pulse is very nice. It looks like strange at the beginning, but in the end, all the populations end up now in the circular state. So when you put the number with the experimental imperfection, the population of circular goes from 77 to 96%. So that's a very good degree of control of this system. So in addition, if you want to do more, you can. So you can even prepare a quantum superposition of the two extremal states of the ladder by using uh, this single pulse technique. In the experiment I discussed pre before, it was not such a control, and we have to stop the evolution before reaching the pathologic states. Here, the pulse is optimized to prepare the quantum superposition of elliptical 52 and m equal 1, and it works very well. This circle is the m equal 1 component, and the circular state is the other component. And here, at the end of the evolution, you have equal weight for these two levels, and you have prepared, uh, with a very high fidelity, a schrodinger cat state, the maximum possible schrodinger cat state of motion of this system. So, indeed, now, uh, I was expecting to present you uh, the quantum simulator project, but I think I was too ambition, uh, ambitious with the timing. So I will talk about that for the people uh, from the school. But I think it's better uh, that I stop here uh, for the talk and go just uh, directly uh, to the conclusion as a kind of uh, appetizer of what I did not have time uh, to tell you. So uh, the idea is that by controlling uh, the transfer from low angular momentum to high angular momentum with bag atom, we expect to be able to prepare deterministically single Rydberg atom for si from single round state atom dropped in optical tweezers, and then uh, to place them in some spontaneous emission inhibition structure, so that in the end we can have a chain of about maybe 50 atoms in a linear configuration, which could be generalized uh, to higher dimension, of trapped circular Rydberg atoms whose lifetime should be larger than one minute for each atom, which means that for 50 atoms, we expect a lifetime of like one second before you lose one of the atoms of the chain. And this opens the perspective to perform quantum simulation at the time scale, which is like 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 times the elementary time scale of the uh, simulator, which is basically uh, characterized by the coupling strength between two neighboring atoms, which is in the range of tens of kilohertz or hundreds of kilohertz. And indeed, that's very different for all other quantum simulators uh, developed up to now, including the Rydberg atom simulator. In the present Rydberg atom simulator, the Rydberg atoms are not trapped. They strongly repel each other due to van der Waals repulsion. And after a few microseconds, everything is gone. So the idea is to switch from microseconds to second time scale by trapping the circular Rydberg atom in an environment which inhibits spontaneous emission. So we will see if this works. And uh, so now uh, let me conclude by mentioning uh, the people of the group. Of course, all this work is a collaboration between uh, many people. And uh, so I thank uh, all the people uh, contributing uh, to this work. And I thank you for your attention.
I can start with a question or other thinking of questions. So it's clear this has lots of technological applications, mm -hmm. but it's not clear to a theorist how we will learn about quantum mechanics from this. Can you say a little bit about, are there any tensions in quantum mechanics that you're going to actually be able to test using this? Okay, so indeed uh, the manipulation of the motion of the electron in the Rydberg orbit is rather on the side of application to sensing than on the side of fundamental quantum uh, experiment. Even if we have Schrodinger cat state, uh, their decoherence uh, here uh, is less, I would say, less fundamental than the one of the cavity cat state, which is very clean because it's energy damping described by a well defined master equation. Here it's not so clean, it's electric no field noise. So if the electric field has some noise, and you always have some noise in electronics, this shakes the energy level and destroys the coherences but it's not very fundamental. So the quantum simulator goes much more in a fundamental direction because the, the, the idea is to acquire the facility uh, to synthesize uh, some Hamiltonian, so this is the so-called XXZ Hamiltonian of a spin chain with coupling between next next bore, uh, either of the Z component of the field or transverse component with all the parameters uh, which are tunable with the Rydberg atom in a range allowing to explore the phase diagram of the system, which is of interest for understanding uh, solid state devices. For example, in 1D, the phase diagram is well known, but the dynamics of the system, the way uh, it evolves, if you do something uh, abrupt or slow, is a very interesting topic. And generalizing this uh, to a set of parallel chains, for example, for having a two-dimensional system, is even more interesting. It opens uh, investigation in the field of topological states of matter uh, in two dimension, which is also a fundamental a field of fundamental interest uh, in quantum theory. In Innsbruck, they are working now on these variational quantum computation method, this variation of quantum computation. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that? You, you mean... Uh, the uh, Rainer Blatt and... Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you just do the same thing with this ma machine? Okay, the same or different? Uh, the, the, what, one difference is, I, I think, uh, we may have a better control of interaction when you, you have more and more uh, particles. And the point is that here you directly, uh, the coupling is directly the, the direct dipole-dipole interaction between two neighbors. And the next neighbor interaction is kind of weak. And then by changing electric and magnetic field, you can tune this in a nice way. And uh, on the other hand, the trapping, uh, the, 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 the way you trap the atom uh, is just uh, an external potential which frees the position of the atom. In the case of the ions, it's kind of more complex because the interaction, eventually long-range interaction, is mediated by the motion of the ion. And you have a coupling between the phonons and the internal state of the ion, which becomes more and more tricky when you have more and more ions, because you have a big matrix coupling many uh, acoustic modes of the chain, which is uh, difficult to handle if you go uh, to more than uh, maybe 20 uh, ions. So I don't say that 20 ions is the limit, but it's tricky, really, to have the controlled interaction with the ion, and it becomes more and more tricky when it, we, you, you, you add ions here. If you add one more atoms, automatically it will interact like the other in the chain. With the ion, it's not, not so simple. And you can do your measurements faster than they can. Uh, okay, right so the measurement issue uh, is not uh, so clear because it can be fast because we can ionize and get charges and count uh, particle, but this is destructive. In case of ions, they make fluoresce, so it needs some time, but the ion is still there. So I, I'm not sure the balance is in favor uh, of us, except if we uh, go one step further by implementing optical detection of the Rydberg atom. So it looks like uh, a, a strange idea because basically the Rydberg atom, once promoted in the circular set, don't, do not have optical transition, but you can play some tricks. So we, we now develop an experiment with strontium so that you still can have optical transition even if the circular Rydberg atoms. And so now we have a very uh, first results 
For this experiment, we prepare a circular state of strontium. We put some light making the ion fluoresce, and we checked for now for short time scale that the circular atom does not auto ionize, as in contrast with the other Rydberg atoms. And we think it's a very good system for going further, not only in the direction of detecting optically the atom, but in eventually cooling uh, the Rydberg atom with lasers. And the circular atom with an active core uh, should be a very good system for that. Thank you. Um, you did mention that uh, photons on cavities uh, decay, have a decay time. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, is that decay time something about the experiment or is it more fundamental? You, you mean the, the fact that the, 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 the quality factor of the cavity is not infinity, there is some dissipation somewhere? Yes. So th th this dissipation uh, is of uh, is related to te technological limit. It okay. has nothing nothing fundamental, but it's difficult in practice to to know which uh, limitation uh, dominates uh, the, the the quality uh, of the mirror because when we make estimates, we have three candidates for uh, explaining uh, this limit uh, of uh, a quality factor of four ten to the ten. So intrinsically, a naivium can do better if uh, you do the mirror with bulk naivium. But indeed, this mirror has not fabricated that of bulk naivium because it's not easy to polish it to have a very nice surface to get rid of diffusion. So it's naivium deposited on copper. It's not as pure as bulk naivium. And uh, we are close uh, to, to the limit of the best uh, coating in this uh, frequency range. But within a factor of few, it's not, it, it, it's not the case. Then you can estimate the, the residual roughness of the mirror. So this you can measure with some devices. And then diffusion of the roughness gives a limit at about 10 to the 11. So it's not far. And you can also try to estimate diffraction on the border of the mirror. So this is a difficult task, because you need a knowledge of the shape of the mode with a precision of 10 to the minus 11. So we don't know how to do that, but there are some people which can do this numerically. And there is a team in France, in Marseille, who made some uh, numerical simulation uh, of diffraction losses for this mirror. So what they say is that the limit should be 10 to the 12. So maybe there is still room for improvement, but it would be a difficult thing. Thank you. When you talk about uh, quantum zeno effect, mm -hmm. what do you use to be the observable? OK, so the observable is kind of the projector of one, on one of the states of the system, which is completely uh, immune for the other states. So it's kind of ambiguous measurements. And uh, So the, the measurement is represented here. You need to have an observable, which have some discrete eigenvector, and they generate a, a subspace of the Hilbert space. And here, if you switch a measurement corresponding to this transition, basically, if, if the others are completely non-resonance, this microwave does not anything to all of that level. So all of that level are kind of degenerate eigenvector of this measurement, where basically, when you switch this on, this remains in this space. The same for the other levels here. And so that's a measurement which divides the, the, the Hilbert space in three uh, sets of levels. The level which is a resonance, that's the measure state, and the, the, the subspace of the other levels. And what is interesting is, is that the subspace of other level is divided into two parts, two half, which does not talk each other. Basically, when you have some dynamic, you are not allowed to cross the border and to go to the, to the rest of the world. And this makes the classical dynamic quantum. Okay. So another important remark is that eventually, 
you don't even need to measure actually the state because I don't need the measurement result. So it means that what I need is to do something to perturb this state so that the perturbation is equivalent to measurement. And indeed, in the experiment, we put the microwave, it dresses this transition, it perturbs the system. We don't need to count if the atom is transferred here or here. The fact that it has a chance to go there is enough to destroy the dynamic and to create the Zeno effect. Okay? Another question? Okay, so let's thank Michelle again for a very nice Thank you. should be food upstairs if people are finished. Yeah. I have a simple question to you. Yes, I, I am. When you are talking about exciting the atom, 